I'm Angela Fairhurst, founder of Jerry Gadgets, a revolutionary solution for dementia care. Inspired by my personal journey caring for my mother with dementia, I developed patented sensory tools that engage loved ones, reduce anxiety, and create joyful moments without medication, providing much needed relief for caregivers. Jerry Gadgets currently come in three silicone buckets with activities like flower arranging, shape sorting, and tactile fidgets with more in development. Each Jerry Gadget is designed to stimulate the senses, fostering connection and communication, even at advanced stages of cognitive decline. Non-toxic, built to last, and dishwasher safe, Jerry Gadgets transform caregiving by promoting engagement, improving quality of life, and offering caregivers a respite from constant supervision. Discover how our innovative products can bring joy and meaningful interaction to your loved ones with dementia while easing the caregiver's burden. Visit jerrygadgets.com to learn more and start making every moment count. For a limited time, you can get 20% off your next order of Jerry Gadgets by going to www.ssww.com Jerry Gadgets for Dementia and enter the special Love Conquers All's coupon code LCA20. Get 20% off Jerry Gadgets today. When the world has got you down, and Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hello, I'm Susie Singer Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. Hello, Susan. Hello, Donald. I wonder I want to first I want to thank everybody for coming today because we always forget to do that, and we do want to thank you for joining us because there are a lot of places you could be and a lot of people you could be listening to, but we're happy you're here. So thank I you agree. for joining us, right? Yeah, I like that. We should do that more often. We should I thank think people. So too. Yeah. All right. Well, I think so thank too. you, Susan. I, I I'll finished, thank you. <laughs> I'm thanking you too, Don. Thank you. I'm You're having I, I just finished reading listening to Oprah's latest book, um, for um What I Know For Sure. Um this is the second the second edition of this because she wrote it I don't know, a decade ago. And now she's revisited. And it's it's you know filled with pearls. A lot of it is about being grateful, and that if you take moments to be grateful, you can't. You know, it it really does make a difference when you are just buried in your life, and you're and you're just on automatic, and you're do going. Especially if you're in a creative uh, endeavor, which is part of this is the uh, theme of today is is creativity and when you're you know when you're in something so deep and you get frustrated because there's always going to be challenges right at least if you could stop and take a moment and say here's what I'm grateful for I'm grateful you know for all the little steps that you've made for everybody that supported you for you know someone who complimented you know your whatever your your the way that you said hello thank you for saying hello someone you know acknowledges that that's so beautiful and we we take those things for granted so i just thought i would share words of wisdom from oprah i we like have- that <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay well uh, yeah because yeah. you do you get so mired in what's you know what's wrong that you you forget what's right and there's a lot right that we you know yeah. we don't tend to uh, think about and we need to well, think we're hard about on ourselves. We're hard on yeah. ourselves, right? Because we want to, yeah. especially if you're A type and you want to do well and you think, oh, I'm going to, you know, oh, why didn't I do it that way? Why didn't I do it? How about, how about looking at what you did do and mm-hmm. say, oh, I'm so happy that that happened and that worked out well, right? And, and, you know, anything worthwhile is going to have challenges and issues you know we're not nothing just happens it just doesn't fall into your lap if it did everybody would be doing it so you know just be acknowledge just acknowledge yourself for the things that you do well and and then be grateful for the people that are around you that can pick up the other pieces for you (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like my, my first mentor, um, uh, Sean McNamara, who directed, well, he directs a lot of stuff. He's got Reagan out right now, but he gave me my first breaks in this industry, and he always said, you know, his... His, his secret sauce was surrounding himself with people that were more talented than himself. So I think, you know, that's not, that's, that's, that is a humble way that's to... That's not hard for me. That would be so simple for me. <laughs> that would be... <laughs> no problem. Got that one done. <laughs> done and done. Box checked. <laughs> and I'm okay, thankful cool. for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Don and I always say like we make one good one smart person because as a mm-hmm. as a production company was like some things are like I would never think of and I'm like, "Oh my god, Don, how did you think of that?" And then he'll the same thing with him. And so yeah, we Yeah, you just, fill in the rest like, of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, speaking of creativity we have we're going to talk about that today art and all those all the lovely things that i love and you love and most people love that um and how it works into caregiving and dementia and alzheimer's and and other progressive diseases and everything in life really right i mean everything in life is more more enhanced and more joyful and i I can't imagine life without art I just can't. So why would why would why would we keep it from anybody? Boggles the mind, right? So um, let's get into talking to our guest, and you're going to interview. You're going to introduce. Dr. Mark Rothman is a physician with over 20 years' experience in elder care, on art in dementia care, and aging at home. Dr. Rothman is CEO of Lizzie Care, a full-service dementia care company that provides the team, tools, and resources that families need to manage their dementia journey at home safely and effectively. He is changing the conversation around dementia and dementia care through the arts with his nonprofit organization, Dementia Spring, supporting the work of those who depict dementia in various mediums. Each week, Dementia Spring publishes an artist spotlight showcasing this work, including a recent piece that we are familiar with, none other than Susie Singer Carter's Oscar-qualified short, My Mom and the Girl. You might have heard of it. Each year, the organization provides grant funding, technical support, and marketing to artists and art programs via the Dementia Arts Impact Award. We are so excited to dive into this wonderful world of creativity. So let's say hello to Dr. Mark Rothman. Hello, Dr. Mark. Hi. Hey, everyone. How are you? Hi, Susie. Yeah. Hi, Don. Hello, Dr. Mark. We're so excited to have you here today because it's our favorite subjects that we're talking about, right? So making, sure. making, educating people about dementia and Alzheimer's and progressive diseases and destigmatizing and talking about how we do it with the arts. And I think that you are a hero. For this so thank you for leading the way and also supporting artists that want to you know also be a part of of changing the narrative about thanks it. Susie so thank you thank you thanks it's great great to be here I'm really grateful for you guys uh, thankful for your uh, kind introduction Don thanks for that and for calling out some of the work that we do here at dementia spring and the foundation the nonprofit that's behind dementia spring and uh, grateful to you, Susie, for connecting with us, sharing with us some of your amazing work. Um, I really loved watching your film, and uh, I'm excited to uh, continue talking to you all about the arts and dementia. It's, you know, it was really a labor of love is how this all started for us here at Dementia Spring. I'm happy to share a little bit about that with you and talk to you about Lizzie Care as well, which has allowed do. me to, it's really allowed me to to be doing dementia and Alzheimer's work all day, every day, kind of using both sides of my brain, right? The medical side of my brain and the business side of my brain, but also the artistic side. Um, you know, after a, after a long day of helping families manage through the, uh, through the dementia journey, navigate the dementia maze and think about important things from a physician standpoint, you know, things like diagnoses and treatments and recommendations and caregiving and things like that. It's great. I get to sort of 
turn the other side of my brain on and read through a script about somebody dealing with dementia or read about a program for dance in a assisted living facility across the country or think about an interesting VR model to help people with dementia, you know, see things that they haven't seen in a long time. And all of that work is just such a great compliment to the busyness of being a doctor and an executive all day long. It's just fantastic. Wow. Well, c- congratulations on making that balance because that's that's a that's not easy to do. So, you no. that's that's very special and, you know, just again, the grateful the G word. I mean, it's it we're we're grateful to have somebody like you that has an understanding of both sides, right? Because I I I don't have all, you know, I've only learned by rote of of what it is means to have dementia or alzheimer's so you know i i stumbled through learning what was the right way to proceed in the journey uh without you know with google as my master but that was about it and then mostly my own experience you know like making a lot of bad horrible mistakes and then going okay that's not the way to go pivoting a lot so it's really it's really very valuable that for you to give both perspectives, both the lenses to, you know, to really provide that information for everybody and maybe, you know, shorten their, their, their tenure, their learning experience. Because mine, you know, it can take a long time till you finally go, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> and it's always changing because the, the disease is always changing, you know, to, to, to say, oh, that worked yesterday, but Guess what? That's not working today. That's exactly. right. Exactly. So, how did you get into this? What brought you into this focus of, of you know, a cog- cognitive decline, really, and and um, mi- you know, mixing it with your with your passion for arts? Obviously, it has to be a passion. You know, when I was in uh, medical school. Uh, I was exposed to what's called an Alzheimer's and Dementia Research Center, and lots of great universities have those, probably a few near you. And that was really the first time, as I was you know, going through medical school, learning about the, you know, the, the heart and the lungs and the liver and the kidneys and all the important things that keep the body going. When I made it into the Alzheimer's Center, it was the first time that I really appreciated how much Alzheimer's is a disease of the entire family. It's a disease of the entire community in a way that a lot of other diseases really aren't. And that that really spoke to me. I I kind of have a humanistic nature in me. And I liked that. It didn't scare me. Um, And, you know, a lot of folks go into medical school, they want to find a problem, fix it, and are not comfortable with things that can't be fixed so easily. I'm a little bit more comfortable with things that can't be fixed so easily, that are a little more complicated, require a little bit more wrestling with it and figuring out things, iterating as you go, like you did, right? Learning day after day. And also just the complexity of families, because it does take a village, right, to take care of a loved one who has Alzheimer's and dementia of any kind, really. And so I was exposed to that, and I really liked that a lot. And I also was exposed for the first time to true interdisciplinary care, which for me is all about not only being the doctors who do the work, but the nurses, the social workers, the nutritionists, the gerontologists that I met at the ADRC there uh, at New York University, And I just loved how they work together in concert. And and for me, that's been a model for my whole career. Part of the reason I chose geriatrics as a a specialty is that it gave me the opportunity to work among teams, um, really, really diverse teams, right? You know, you can't, you, you kind of equate the playing field a little bit because what the social worker or what the dietitian has to say about this particular problem, I'm sure you've encountered a problem related to mom not eating or not being able to chew or not being able to digest or you know, different foods that she likes. That contribution is really just as important as the physician's contribution, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. I really love that. And that's really what got me into geriatrics and got me, and just propelled my, my career. It was later, and, and I've always been an arts person. I was a reviewer for the Bellevue Literary Review back in medical school, a wonderful journal that describes illness and how people cope and deal with illness and, and overcome sometimes, succumb sometimes, but navigate those journeys you know, through a creative lens. And uh, my wife's also in the arts. Uh, she's a book restorer and, an am- book restorer and amateur photographer. And um, you know what happened is when the pandemic hit, all the people that we knew with dementia who were accessing the arts and all the people who were leading 
on the other side, from the artistic side, to help people with dementia, they were all out of work. They were just done in a day. I mean, the world just shut down. And so the folks with dementia were cut off from all the creativity, and the artists were, you know, screwed. <laughs> they couldn't right. find their clients. They couldn't get paid. They couldn't make a living. And Cece and I, my wife, decided this is the time to launch Dementia Spring and the Dementia Spring Foundation because we realized not only do these populations need to be connected more and more, they need to be connected better than has been done in the past. It's not that organized how all this happens. It's starting to happen better now. Um, and also that I've always felt very passionately that we need to change the narrative around dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. I always look back and I say, there was a period of time when you couldn't say the word cancer out loud, right? The C word. Mm -hmm. Nobody would say it over dinner. Right. And eventually, when you think of cancer right now, you think of pink balloons and parades and, and marches for breast cancer. You think of ribbons and awareness and people who are surviving and thriving. Same thing was largely true with heart disease. You could not say the word heart attack in my grandparents' generation around the table. You would whisper it. You would never say it out loud. And now when we think of heart attacks, we think of stents and Lipitor and red pillows that you hug after surgery and yeah. the heart walk. I mean, you just this is what your brain thinks of. Even HIV, which was essentially, you know, a death, a death sentence, sentence at the beginning, yeah. eventually became associated with rainbows. So I knew that as I knew that in healthcare the same thing can happen for Alzheimer's and must happen for Alzheimer's because the prevailing view when you say the word out loud is nursing homes and wheelchairs. Right. And that does not represent the totality of the experience of Alzheimer's disease anymore at all. No. Granted, in the past, people were hidden. They were kept away from their neighbors. They largely were made prisoners in their own homes sometimes. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous amount of shame and fear that still exists. I'm not denying that it exists. But the reality is that Tons of people with Alzheimer's and dementia are living today. They're living their lives. As I joke sometimes with people, they don't love to hear it. People with mild cognitive impairment and early dementia are on the roads with us. They I, I, I was okay. going to quote you. I was going to okay. quote you what you said about when you were, you know, presenting my, my film. You said, I'm going to quote it. You said, as I remind folks all the time, persons living with dementia are all around us in the supermarket and at the park, in the theater, and the, and even driving. even driving. So, right? right? And so I, I love that. I love that you say that because it's true. And we picture people differently. Like, you know, and I say in the beginning of my journey with my mom, I tried to shield her from the public because I thought that for her own dignity, I thought, and then I, and then I suddenly realized that the more that I shared what was going on and allowed her to be her, people stepped up, and people didn't didn't dismiss her or treat her disrespectfully. They yes. embraced her. Yeah, yeah, and um, and you know, and 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 if you think about the length of time that these diseases can last, it's not all wheelchairs and nursing homes. That's a portion of it. But that is not even probably the majority. And so our viewpoint of this must change. It's so myopic to think of wheelchairs and nursing homes instantaneously. We have to yeah. fundamentally change the perception of this in the public's minds. And, you know, a little humble pie. The doctors aren't going to be the ones to do it. I love us. I'm, I'm part, of the, part of the squad. I'm in the team. I'm a physician and a proud physician and a healer. The doctors are not going to be the ones to change the narrative for society. It's people like no. artists who are going to do mm -hmm. that through books and films and song and dance and just incredible expressions. You know, they have the freedom to sort of be to exaggerate, to make the point, right, to, to point out the humor in the journey. Physicians don't have the time to do that or the inclination or the training to do that. So right. that's sort of how Dementia Spring got born. And we decided we were going to write uh, we were going to fund grants to independent uh, grassroots artists who are trying to get work completed so that we can help bring that to the public uh, and teach everybody that there's a new way of looking at memory loss, dementia, and Alzheimer's in this world. And uh, that's our challenge for tomorrow. I love it. And also, I'm going to add that it may not be the doctor's responsibility or their inclination, but 
On the other hand, our, our healthcare system and our providers need to be a little bit more educated on ex what it is to have Alzheimer's, what it is, because a lot of them don't know. And a lot of people, like in, you know, first responders, um, ER rooms, don't really understand Alzheimer's and dementia and mistake it for other it, things. And so there is, you know, a, a even wider net that we need to throw in terms of education. You know, they may, they don't, they may not, ha they don't have to understand it or embrace it the way we do, but they need to for the, for, to be responsible is to understand that somebody with Alzheimer's who may not be mobile, that's their base, and maybe they're, they're, they're not speaking anymore. That's their base, but they are still enjoying their life. Mm -hmm. So, And just because someone's in a wheelchair um, doesn't mean that they, they're not valuable because yes. they're valuable to their family and they're valuable to, to what they can still give. And so that's what I want to share too. At that stage, is is still valuable and still and deserves dignity and quality in care and um, and empathy. Yeah. yeah. And also well, you, on a practical end, because you know, Susie, it led with your mom. She was the, because the doctors did not understand her Alzheimer's. It led to her. I mean, something that changed her life and your life and everyone around her life completely when they basically, you know, strapped her down and drugged her because they didn't know, they, w they weren't able to, to tell what was going on and how to deal with it. And it changed her right. life after yeah. that forever, mm. you know. That's and true. so, it's, so on, a health, yeah. on a health point, it's very important. And, it's, and first response, this is what we showed in the film, in My Mom and the Girl, mm -hmm. you know, with the police, mm -hmm. that they didn't recognize. And it's hard to recognize sometimes when they're at a certain stage where they can be completely, you know, normal and, you know, you're talking yep. to, and then something happens and, you know, not being able to recognize that, that's, that's, ve it's very important. It really is. Yeah. What do you, yeah. yeah no, yeah. I, I, I agree. You, and first of all, and Susie, you said what you said extre extremely well. I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, when I did, speaking of having to train lots of folks in society to recognize these people, when I did um, training for disaster management after 9-11, I had to um, write up plans for fire departments of how to get people out of nursing homes effectively. They, they didn't sort of understand how to get in and out of nursing homes safely without putting those people in additional jeopardy. Luckily, a lot of that work was done, and then some of the training existed for things like the pandemic and other things like SARS and, and uh um, and other, other, you know, illnesses that came through and we had disaster responses, but it's the little things like, you know, how do you behave with somebody who's acting unusual in a supermarket, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't think to themselves, could this person have memory loss? Could I be mm -hmm. witnessing somebody who really is harmless and fine, but has memory loss is not crazy, right? Is not, it's, right. it's, it's very hard to, you know, again, people really are so used to seeing physical signs of disease that right. they can rec that they can recognize. Oh, they're limping, right? Oh, they oh they you know have a wheelchair. Oh, they have a oxygen on. They obviously have a pulmonary problem. Dementia, you know, it's can be invisible until you really spend time with somebody and understand what they're going through. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. The other thing that really always inspired me about um, the arts for dementia in particular and Alzheimer's disease is that if you think very anatomically about the brain, the portions of the brain that hold the keys for participation in the arts, appreciation of the arts, and memory of the arts, for example, music from your youth mm -hmm. or song, are actually in a different part of the brain right. than, than the part that allows people to answer their family's questions all day long. And I always say right. it very, I always say it very specifically like that because I need to separate out for folks things that you can do that this person still has efficacy to do and could potentially enjoy, by the way, and benefit from. We can talk about the benefits of the arts for people with memory loss in a little bit, but that is fundamentally distinct from the part of the brain that is not giving you the answers you want when you ask them 30 questions this afternoon. Right. They're very different, right? The ability of, to, of somebody to understand your questions. How was your breakfast this morning? What did you have for lunch yesterday? Did you see your daughter? When's your, when's your 
granddaughter's birthday. What's my name? All of these right, questions right, that, right, 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 that right. everybody is asking all day long, for better right. or for worse, the parts of the brain that that are not functioning well, that don't give you the answers you want to that, are totally distinct from the parts of the brain that get somebody up singing, dancing, and loving their life for an hour in the afternoon, even with moderate dementia. So I try to tell people, this is a, this is a wonderful um, opportunity to work on the parts of the brain that are not the same parts of the brain that are making you frustrated all day because you can't get answers to your questions and people are acting weird. So exactly. focus on that part. Focus on that part I of the there's a there's one of my mentors is Judy Cornish who you know uh, from the Dawn Method and, and really d- makes a great distinction about that and she talks about the yeah. rational mind, which yeah. is the mind the part of your mind that makes decisions and you know makes you know executive decisions right mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. then there's the emotional side of your brain right. and speech so and that, speech and speech right and so the those two are distinctly different, and and so and 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 she reckons that the emotional side really never leaves, like that never mm-hmm. gets impaired. And I agree. I saw that with my mom, and she had the disease for 16 years. And I, I to the to the day she took to the moment of her last breath, she was there emotionally, um, responsibly. In with her emotions mm-hmm, very mm-hmm. appropriately, and so I did. I did witness that, and I do agree with you. And I mean, it, I, I I was told that that art. Well, of course, from my mom, who was a singer, that was her cognitive reserve. But but I was told that art is stored in the hippocampus, which doesn't get affected. Is that true or? It's the opposite. It's the, the the speech and a lot of the logical stuff and processing is largely in the hippocampus, and okay. the, the emotional pieces are stored elsewhere. You, you know, I the, gotcha. the, okay. the, the response to, to color, the response to sound, the res, the emotional responses are stored elsewhere. Um, so I we've heard that. all uh, for a long time. I think am I, people am I too dark for you. I apologize. <laughs> oh, it, it, no. it's very dramatic. It's great. It's, great. it's fine. The sun, the, um, sun, the sun went behind a cloud. I'm sure it'll come out in a minute. <laughs> it's Even great. It's fine. Um, so we've heard for a long time, and I think a lot of people know that music is definitely yes. something that you know that that taps in but now you've explored all different mediums you're you're you're, you're very and and are we finding so the visual the like what what are those different mediums how did you find that why why they can respond to that too so you know if if you take a step back for a second and you look at what we've learned over the last let's call it 30 years about the connection between arts and healing or arts and medicine Maybe it's no surprise, but I think it's worth reiterating a little bit. The effects of the arts have been shown to be positive in a whole bunch of different ways, right? So obviously mental health. The arts have been shown to help people with PTSD, to help people with anxiety and depression, to help people out of crisis situations. Uh, It's helped people with post-traumatic things, even like after being in the ICU and hospitalized. So the connection to mental health in general, both as a treatment and also as a preventative measure, right, to build efficacy, confidence, has been well shown to demonstrate it. The arts have actually been shown to help medical education. The arts have been shown to increase empathy among medical students, which is something that's very important because we're healers and we need to be empathic mm-hmm. to the people that we care for. Um, you know, art has very much been shown, and I'm including, you know, music, visual arts, performing arts. I tend to talk about the visual and the performing arts, less about books and and written material. Um, It's been shown to be great for pain control and for modulating the need for aggressive opiate therapies, right? You can decrease Mm -hmm. the need for opiates by helping people use the arts to get through their pain crises and improve their quality of life. Um, And, you know, and then obviously in dementia, obviously with children, the arts have been shown to help tremendously in many diseases in children with coping as well as with uh, efficacy and confidence. And for dementia, the arts has been shown very nicely, consistently, pretty consistently, to improve mood, to decrease anxiety and depressive symptoms, mm-hmm. to improve uh, quality of life for caregivers, to potentially reduce neuropsychological symptoms and the need for strong medications that sometimes get used for those symptoms 
Um, and it's actually been shown to improve some short-term memory, maybe not permanently, but to improve some verbal fluency and improve some um, autobiographical memory in people living with dementia, even partially advanced. So, you know, it might sound strange for a physician to be talking about using the arts in the care and the uh, treatment and the uh, support of people with dementia, but it shouldn't come as much of a surprise to people. So I think yeah. that's, it's always, it's always worth kind of backing up and reminding ourselves that the arts, to your point earlier, like they're everywhere, they're beneficial, and it's actually been studied with research. Right. I think what, one thing that just to, to, you know, double up on that is that, you know, when my mom was, you know, obviously she was, I say, straddling the fence, which is when the movie was taking place. So she knew yep. she had Alzheimer's, but was fighting against it. Right. And um, when she sometimes she would say to me, I don't know when I get addled, I can't think like I can't think when I get addled. Yep. So which, you know, which is to get, you know, anxious or and, and when you can't remember something, we all get anxious. How many times have you gone? Oh, my God, I just had that. It's like, yep. I, oh, my God, it's scary when you can't think of something. It's frustrating. It's scary. It's embarrassing sometimes. And all those things exasperate the the that yes. the manifestation of the disease right so Literally. when someone is calm like my mom when i would give her music cuz music was our was our magic sauce that was our magic sauce and i and comedy i would see her relax i would see those synapses work so much better Yes. And to the point when she couldn't even speak, there was I was doing a dog and pony show for her one day, and out of nowhere, she just said to me, "I love you," mm, like that. And that was like, uh, to me, that was like she ran a marathon. I've said that before because at that point, it was really difficult for her to get a word out. And so, but she was so relaxed that that, that it allowed her to whatever it takes, I say, like she looks for the word, finds it, gets it there, puts it on the muscles and then gets it out. It's a lot when you have Alzheimer's, right? And yes, I think that we lot. need to keep that in mind. And another thing to your point is that making it more difficult on somebody with like arts makes it easier to communicate when it's not easy. You know, it's, 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 it creates a shutdown. It does. It just shuts them down. So like when one thing that Judy taught me was when I would go into my mother's room to see her, when I go to visit, I would never say, hi, mom, who am I? Or I, I wouldn't say, hi, do you know who I am? I would say, hi, mommy, it's Susie, your favorite daughter. I'm here. And then she'd get a big smile on her voice, on her face, right? Because she didn't have to think. I told her the answer. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And, and, I always think about it also in terms of the what I call the pervasive isolation and the pervasive sort of loneliness of mm -hmm. the dementia journey and and that I, the way I think about it is it sort of it sort of emanates out because for the person with dementia almost every single family that I work with with dementia of any stage really even early their world has already started to shrink inappropriately quickly and a lot of what I focus on is trying to make sure that we stop that from happening and actually expand the world a little bit again for everybody's sake. Because what happens is when the world shrinks for the person with the disease, I find that for the family around them, or at least for the number one caregiver, which often is someone like yourself, their world starts to shrink too. And mm -hmm. so you end up in this sort of weird cycle of shrinkage. And um, almost every time I get involved with the family through the work that I do with Lizzie Care, and I bring the arts in, we can expand that world, right? That world in, can, can quickly, quickly enlarge, at least a little. And it is amazing the responses that families feel like, oh, thank God we're back to doing some of these fun things. We haven't painted in a year and a half. We haven't gone hiking in a year and a half. We didn't go drive around in the old model car that dad loves for a year and a half. It's just, you know, it's just been pervasive. The families have been blocking, tackling, dealing and coping every day and trying to get their lives done and take care of whatever they have to take care of, cats, kids, whoever. And, um, you know, everyone stopped doing fun activities, exercise, hobbies, and the arts are just like a great way to bring somebody even without skills or training, right? It's just a great way to bring them sort of back out 
from the tunnel that they're in. And mm-hmm. it's just, it just is so fascinating to watch that happen with families. And so, you know, you think about the benefit of treatment through art, and I have colleagues, uh, colleagues of yours and mine, who are determined to get the arts like paid for by insurance companies, like they're fighting like tooth and nail. Um, but when you think about it for a treatment for isolation and for loneliness and boredom, I mean, it's cheap, it's safe, and it's effective. It's I mean, effective. I mean, you know, that's that's the the trifecta for a doctor, right? Cheap therapeutics, safe therapeutics, and effective therapeutics. I'm in. And And, and such a a benefit. Oh, go. I just wanted to say such a benefit for the caregiver because, you know, I as I watch Susie go in and do her dog and ponies continuously, eventually, and especially if the other person can't, you know, communicate back. It's like, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to say? What can, yes. you know, what is, and it's a big stress <laughs> on the caregiver. Like what, and it, it makes them not want to do it is because it's like, oh my God, that's, that's a negative thing. So this is something you can share. Yes. You both enjoy it and you both enjoy it together. And if I could double down on that for a second, it actually also, I find, affects then sort of the second degree of the, of the circle around families because if the if the loved one is struggling to have that conversation right on a daily basis, friends and friends and other distant family they pull away very early, right? Yep. Because 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 it is hard. I mean, uh, my yep. wife and I we we've, we've taught with Grandma Sandy who, who's going through Alzheimer's in, in New York, and we visit frequently. We've taught our kids back to something you said, Susie. We've sort of taught our kids to not be dependent on the conversation when we visit. Mm-hmm. Let's. Be dependent on closeness. Let's get really close, right? Let's sit really close and touch, right? Yes. Let's let's hum. Let's sing a song. Let's let's let her hear us talking to other people without kind of trying to get an answer out of her all the time. And so back to isolation and loneliness. I'm we're, I'm, I'm helping to care for a family where a companion was brought in to do some of this with their loved one because they weren't doing it. And the husband actually had was slowed down from some other personal reason. He couldn't really keep up with her. What's interesting is that old friends who hadn't made an appointment to see this person in a really long time, now that they have a companion, they can go see them. So it's just really interesting. So, so what do they meet? They meet at the museum, right? Like that's how, it, you know, you just sort of, you, you build it around the arts, partially because in lots of communities, the arts are free. Yeah. And, and if you think about all these artists that we work with at Dementia Spring, you know, people like, you know, the, the Songworks program, people who are doing things online with dance, you can get a lot of this stuff for free online. They're practically giving it away. And I know it's, people feel uncomfortable, but, you know, um, the minute you begin a song or the minute you begin something colorful and vibrant, or acting a little bit, or playing comedy roles and being goofy, you'd be shocked. People who have memory loss, they jump right in. Like, they're oh, just God, ready yeah. to go. They're ready to Definitely. go. Definitely. Yeah. I have a quick anecdote. When, when, when my mom Please. was at uh, Memory Care, and there was, we got to know everybody in the facility that were the residents, and they became sure. like family, right? And one woman named Ruth, who didn't talk, at all she had a she had a companion with her she didn't talk but she was you know always social she was there but didn't say a word and we were singing one day around the table and we were singing a Beatles song we were doing harmony and all of a sudden she starts to sing with us out of nowhere a beautiful voice and um, I and her caregiver said Ruth you're singing and she goes of course it was so incredible. Like, I get chills just saying that right now because I remember that was, you know, I always knew that music worked with my mom, but then I saw it, you know, and, and, and also to add up to that is like whenever I would go, my daughters are singers too, we'd sing a cappella or we'd put on, a, you know, an album and sing along to it. Everybody came around. Everybody. Sure. They loved it. Right? For sure. Yeah, for sure. We'll be right back. I'm Peter, owner of Peter Sand Photography, and I want to talk to you about something important, preserving memories. Time moves quickly, and before we know it, those we love may no longer be with us. For the last few years, I've taken complimentary professional headshots of seniors in a local retirement home. 
helping families capture the essence and personality of their loved ones through beautiful photos. I've seen firsthand how meaningful these images can be. When I photograph my own parents, I realize how powerful it is to have these lasting memories, photos that capture smiles, stories, and the unique spirit of the people we care about most. If your parents or loved ones are still with you, don't wait. These images can bring comfort and joy for years to come, whether it's for remembering silly moments or honoring family history. My message is simple. Get photos of your loved ones while you can. Hire a local photographer, use your camera, cell phone, whatever it takes. Just do it now. For more information, visit peteristvanphotography.com. So in terms of arts, like I know from my mother, there got to a point where not not very long into her disease when it was difficult for her to watch a movie, right? Mm -hmm. and because yeah. you... St She's very zen, like, you know, Alzheimer's is yes. the epitome of zen. So yes. she couldn't keep the narrative. She couldn't keep the string, the thread at all. And it was frustrating. So, half, you know, like very quickly she'd be off looking around. She's not really watching. And, and I think it, be, you know, just becomes a source of frustration. And I see all the time in nursing homes where they just yes. wheel people into a room with a movie going and they're just, and no wonder they're asleep because they can't follow it. Right? Yes. What do you think we could do about that? Well, there's a lot of great programs that are out there. They're all sort of small cottage. They're happening. They're just beautiful things that are happening, usually by the strength of will of the um, recreation therapist in the building. Um, mm -hmm. But there are folks who are doing all kinds of physical, um, tactile things with yarn, with thread, with colorful ribbons. There are people who they always have music involved in that, right? They make sure that the music is happening. Some of the more structured programs really have it down, right? Where it's sort of like we start out with a song, right? We sort of wake up the creative brain. We wake up the creative spirit with a song together. So everyone's sort of singing and getting in the mood and it's, it's, it's triggering very deep and old memories from childhood, from yeah. Yeah. camping trips, from church, from wherever those memories are deep down. And we know that people with dementia have the old memories still ingrained there. They can't remember what they had for lunch yesterday, but there's imagery from the very, very remote past that stays inside the brain for a very long time, mm -hmm. not always easily accessible, but when you trigger it with a song or with something like that. So programs like that will start out with song, then they'll move into something more tactile with mm -hmm. colors and with shapes, with pens, with things to do on a paper, things that stick mm -hmm. to things. Very, very unstructured, let people do what they can. Usually the successful ones sit people around a table because even because that socialization, that sort of being together and having activities together and hearing little bits of laughter and little bits of cajoling, that's actually very social, yeah. right? I mean, that's a very social thing. Most of the time in places like that, they're only put together at tables for eating. Right. So e eating is essentially a silent activity. <laughs> so, right? So now yeah. you've got activities happening like that, right? Sometimes really, really good programs will also then bring in potentially a little bit of an intergenerational uh, component here. Maybe they'll have children visiting or they'll have high schoolers come in and sort of just talk and chit chat and just hearing those voices again. Um, even if you can't understand all the words, as long as it's not disturbing, it can actually be sort of enlivening. And then if often in these programs, they'll trigger in a little bit of dance. So for those who are not in a wheelchair who can get up and dance, you'll find often a lot of times they'll want to dance now, right? Because yeah. the music's still playing. They're having a good time. And so, you know, these programs are tough to run. So I used to work in a very large nursing home organization. These programs are hard to run. They cost mo more money than a lot of people want to spend, right? A lot of times they're making tough choices around beds versus, you know, fixing the roof versus staffing, which is a very tough challenge in general. Progr uh, money for these programs is just kind of hard to come by. And... Um, it is very difficult. I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in nursing homes, and I've seen beauty there that is just tremendous. I've seen human beauty in people and relationships that just knock you off your feet. But I've also seen a lot of loneliness, isolation, and boredom, yes. and it is very, very hard to push back on that. I, I, I'm that empathetic. Leads, and, yeah, that yeah. leads to failure to thrive. We saw that in oh, um, easily. 
easily. In the pandemic, that's what it, you know. Completely. I, I, I always repeat this number because 200,000 residents that shouldn't have died during the pandemic died from failure to thrive, and that's from being isolated. Isolation yeah. is a killer. It is. It really it's one is. of Anybody the, would be. None of us want to be isolated. That's why they put, right. you know, criminals in. Right. Yeah, in, solitary you know, confinement as the ultimate. Uh, that's the ultimate torture is put them alone. And that's it's what we're torture. doing. Uh, babies don't <laughs> thrive. Animals do. don't thrive. Nobody thrives. Nobody Your plants thrives. don't thrive by themselves. I mean, we living things need living things, right? It's true. It's really true. So, and it really breaks my heart that, you know, and it's why I'm do, we're doing No Country for Old People, our, our documentary, because to hear you say that there isn't enough money to, you know, have these programs that are, that are vital to life, because they are life. You know, yes. life is not just getting medicine and eating. That yes. is not the extent of no. a life. No. So, so that if you're going to call yourself a nursing home and not in a nursing institution, then you need to provide those kinds of uh, an access to that kind of, of life, right? That 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 portion of life, which is stimulation and and yes. you know happiness and art all that stuff so entertainment recreation and yes. so and there is enough money mark there is enough money for there is us. enough, there money. Is enough I, money definitely out there there's no question you know I, and i've and i've i've seen it and i've seen it done really well um but it's it's often intermittent right it's not as regular as it needs to be it's not as structured as it should be it doesn't always have the best leader leading it so you know it's it's right. it's tough to it's tough to make it work one of the projects that we funded at dementia spring is the day by day project out of columbus ohio which essentially is a silent disco dance arts engagement tool that they've brought into assisted livings and nursing homes now pretty much across Ohio. They've really succeeded. We funded them with a grant uh, three years ago, and they've had a great, great run. They got funding from a local um, a county to put their innovations into every single nursing home in the county. So in these nursing homes, you have people who are wearing silent disco technology. One of the things that's so important about um, silent disco, I don't know if you guys are silent disco people no, or not. No, tell, tell us what that is. So the, si silent the silent... Disco. The, so the silent discos are you've seen, you might have seen these at fundraisers or at benefits or at parties. It's where it's a it's a dance, it's a club, right? It's a disco, but instead of hearing the music out in the room, which is what you're used to when you walk into a room for a disco, every single person is wearing headphones, and the music is playing only for them. Oh, now I've never heard of this. Okay. It's very cool. Teenagers know all about it. Any teenagers who are watching your podcast are rolling their eyes right now. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, we apologize. We apologize that we're catching up to technology in yeah, the real world. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for teaching us. We're, we we yes. appreciate you. We're grateful for you. Yes, grateful um, for you. Um, but um, it's, it's great. It does two or three things. One of the things is, is it makes the room less loud and crazy, right, cacophonous, because there's no music playing out. Anything. It also lets different channels be programmed so that some people in the room can be listening to a different song than the other people in the room, but they're all it's still brilliant. dancing. It's brilliant. Which is, which is brilliant. So if you need to program some 40s tunes versus some Beatles tunes, right? you can do that, right? Some people like Frank, some people like, you know, John Lennon. So you, you know, right. so you, you could have them in the same room. If you knew their tastes, you could give them headphones and they'd hear their music, not what everyone's hearing. Not everyone in the room is hearing the same music. But what's most important in my mind from the medical standpoint and the physiology standpoint is that a lot of the problem for people with Alzheimer's disease on the listening side is that the streams are always getting crossed, right? Think about a room at a Christmas party. There's too many voices. Think about a time you went to a restaurant. Sure. It's not necessarily the volume. It's that there's too many inputs, Right. There's right, words right, right. coming from over here. There's words coming from over there. There's there's someone behind you talking. And you and I have the ability to mostly filter that out and decide who we're going to pay attention to. People right. with Alzheimer's don't have that ability. They've lost the ability to filter and to prioritize. And so it all just becomes this cacophonous stew of sound that they're supposed to respond to. It's hard to know. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the silent disco is it isolates that's the only noise they hear is that song. 
I love that so much. I love mm. it. So perfect. So perfect. Even if you're in a room full of people trying to sing songs, you know, an alarm's going off down in bed number three. There's a siren outside like there was at the beginning right. of your podcast. Um, you know, there's all kinds of noises. Someone's over the loudspeaker. You know, we need somebody in a room. You know, there's two and there's people next to them making noise. But with the with the headsets on, it's pure. It's pure. It's very much like the image and video you've all seen of music and memory those first those first patients in the music and memory program where they put the headphones on the person sitting in the wheelchair and they started alive tapping. inside alive, alive inside, inside. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know yeah so so picture that writ large and just magnified um with a little piece of technology it's great and they have a whole program that you can um you can sort of selectively make a playlist for them. You get to get to know about their lives, get to know when they grew up, get to know what music they liked, program it in. And then you've got the whole place dancing. They bring maracas, they bring cha-chas, they bring tambourines. It's, oh, and I want to see video of great, that. I want to see video. And by the way, I've danced with people in nursing homes. I've danced with them in wheelchairs. So yeah, people, for sure. when they want to move, they want to sure. move. For sure. I've danced so with a, them. Yeah. 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 So that's a that's that's a great example. That's a great example of a, of a, a project. It. I we love it. I love it so much. Check it out. So how do we how do we you know? It feels like the only way we get this into you know wide out there into all the facilities and everything is to somehow show how this is going to either save or make them money. That's that's the the only way. It's hard. To, it's difficult, but it is difficult. Can you show? I mean, I'm sure you can show. Wait, if you do this, then all of these costs go away. The, or they, you know, they are, they are, you know, it, it looks like in the long run, this will actually be beneficial to you as an organization. Can you do that? Is it something you're trying to do right now? So I, I'm, I'm not focused on that particular segment right. today. Um, there is good evidence for it. The trick is you have to have somebody who really believes it and wants to put it into play. You know, you need leaders to believe that not only will they have less behavioral disturbance, but they'll use less medicines to control those behavioral disturbances, mm -hmm. which is better for the patients because we know they come with black box warnings that, you know, they can be dangerous if, not, if overused. But they also can save on that expense. Then also from the staffing side, the people who are taking care of those loved ones in those facilities, if the patients are having less behavioral problems and have better moods and less anxiety and less depression, their job becomes easier. So it actually helps you around the entire sort of horn of the entire facility. It's really a cultural shift in my mind that people need uh, to latch onto, which is to say that we're going to be an institution that delivers the arts in a big way, right? We're going we're gonna to hang our hat on this and we're going to fund it and we're going to do it right. It's just, it's hard to find folks out there in the community who are trying to run their businesses who will adopt that writ large, right? They'll, they'd rather, it's easier to go try to save money on a, on a better toilet paper contract than it is on arts therapy. And we're trying to dispel the myth that it's overly complex or that you can't find it anywhere. There's so much good programming happening all around the country, actually, um, in little pockets. You just got to find it and bring it in and welcome it. It seems like the, the, the big step would be to the, pe to, the, to the owners of these institutions who are employing this to talk to the other ones and saying, guess what, guys, I'm doing this. Everyone's happier, and I just saved you know blank amount of money every month by it doing happening. this. That's that's the way yeah. it's going to happen because you know but, we can demand it, but until they hear from yes. somebody who's actually doing it, and it's starting, that, yeah. it's starting to happen. Yeah. It's starting to percolate. I'm, I mean, that's part of why Dementia Spring exists, right? Which is to show yeah. that these things can happen, that they're not incredibly expensive, and that uh, you can latch onto them. I also always feel like. If that's part of your story in your community, people are really going to like that in your community, right? People are going to want to be part of that, right? Your, your staff people are going to want to be part of that. I, I, I always view things through the lens of how do we retain our best people? You make their environment to work in fun and lovely and purposeful and meaningful. And you pay them well, obviously, of course. But you bring that in and all of a sudden the place that they're working becomes fundamentally transformed. Yeah, and, can, and absolutely. I think what... 
what's important that also to, to piggyback on Don, what he was saying about show, you know, showing, like quantifying what, what arts actually do in terms of, you know, from your perspective and because you're such an advocate for it, that it's going to take, you know, the community at large, the collective, to say to the people that hold the purse strings, which is CMS, and, I, you know, I, that's just me saying CMS, yep. you're not looking at what's important for these quality of life, for quality of life. We're not just talking about quantity, we're talking about quality. So I think yep. that that's what we're, that's my goal, is to make that shift to educate what you're doing, educate everybody to say, oh, of course, these people deserve this kind of life. It's not, we're not just keeping them alive, you know, in a bed, that they need a full, you know, full scope of life. And that, and, and that comes down to CMS who writes the checks mm -hmm. to these mm -hmm. facilities. Yes. So CMS needs to step up and re reevaluate what are priorities, staffing one of them, paying people to want to work there in a, and give them benefits and make the environment you know attractive like you just said mm -hmm. to want to go to work to look forward to it because consistency as you know as a doctor consistency and care you know especially in alzheimer's and dementia is is paramount right yes yes and and cms has actually recently taken a really important step in trying to address some of the needs of patients and families dealing with dementia especially at home they've established a new model of care where they're going to finally sort of pay for some of the care management and navigation type services that my organization, Lizzie Care, does. And of course, in my practice, we've always done. But CMS is finally going to start paying for folks who have expertise in dementia and what the journey looks like to counsel families like yours over time. The truth is that today you can go to primary care a lot, but they don't have all the resources to help you on your dementia journey. Right. right, right. The neuro neurologists also are very helpful, yes, but they don't have all the tools necessary to help you on your dementia journey. And the truth is there is expertise out there, but it has often been underfunded. Um, and there's not a lot. Of, there's not a lot. I mean, there's, I'm a geriatrician. There's only 5,000 of us in the entire country. And it's getting less from what I've heard. People it's are getting not less. really. Yeah. Yes. I, I remember CMS one day. Started. I remember one day a doctor, my mom, my stepdad was having surgery. My mom was in the throes of Alzheimer's and kept wanting to ask the, the doctor as he walked by, how is George? How is George? How? And yes. he walked up to me later on and went, do you, need, do you need a prescription to Valium? I'm just asking. To me, I don't know if it was a joke or what, but it was like, it, was, it really highlighted the fact that he clear, you know, he represented a, 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 a part of our you know, community that doesn't understand it. And that, you know, we, it's not going to go away if I take a Valium. It's not going to change right. mom. That's right. That's right. right. So, you know, learning, learning how to cope, you know, for so many families like you, you're, you're at home, you're, you're living the journey, you're doing the blocking and tackling, like I said, but you're largely on your own. Yeah. Fending for yourselves and trying to navigate the maze of dementia yeah. care in our country. Yeah. And yeah. I, I fundamentally don't like that. <laughs> I think that needs to change. And luckily, CMS has now started to pay for some of those services. Not a ton, That's but so a great. Pay, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's a start. It is. It is. It's a new model of care. It's, it's called a value-based care model. Um, and it's like the work that we do at Lizzie Care, which is trying to stay very close with families like yours and say, where are you on the journey? And how can we help you anticipate what's coming? How can we help get ahead of the crisis before the crisis happens. So you don't right. have to go to the emergency room and get offered Valium. So you don't have to <laughs> have a, so you don't have, so you don't have to place somebody in a nursing home quickly out of a, because of a crisis where you can't, a lot of the things that happen to people along the dementia journey are a little bit predictable actually. And for people like me who have expertise in this, I can usually see those crises long before they happen. And oh, you're so- you're such a gem, Mark. You're such a gem. <laughs> So now, you know, now we've, we've put together a whole team at Lizzie Care who essentially helps families just by being tight with them for the journey. And when we see that something needs to change so that we can avoid a crisis or we see that the world has shrunk too much and it's time to put a companion in with your loved one or we see that it's time to have a conversation about maybe not being at home anymore. Might, maybe it's gotten a little too complex. Either way, you get the benefit of, you know, expertise, patience, 
a trust factor that's not always there when you're in crisis and people are poking themselves in and out trying to help you through the crisis. Um, so it's really great. I think CMS is kind of, you know, it's a it's a um, innovation program. So it's a, it's called a pilot. But I think they're beginning to tiptoe themselves into the dementia situation in America, seeing how many people are dealing with it today and how the new medications are going to put pressure on CMS to help more than they ever have before. They've mostly left it to families and to Medicaid to deal with. The reality is they're going to have to get a little more proactive. And this program is designed to do that. So we're pretty excited about it. And is this program, is it A, available everywhere? And B, is there a cost to it? How does that all work? So it's for people who have a diagnosis of dementia. It's, it's not available everywhere. You kind of have to find those practices and organizations that have gotten themselves sort of certified and credentialed in the program. We're called participants in the program. And as long as you can find one of them, you can look it up on the internet on CMS. The program is called GUIDE, G-U-I-D-E. It stands for Guiding Some Kind of Improved Experience in Dementia. And um, you can figure out if there are guide providers in your area and see if you can get connected. Um, Some of them are already big medical centers. So the big medical center that some people have already started going to, right? Maybe there's a dementia research center at the university. They might have applied for the guide model. So they're probably already doing the work for you, um, for families. But at least now they get a funding source and they can expand their programming to bring on more coaches for families to give coaching. They can bring on more care managers to help navigate the journey and find resources for you instead of telling you to go find resources for yourself. Um, There are a little bit of a focus on medication management because we know that in people with dementia, the risk of polypharmacy, taking too many medicines that are interacting with each other is a big risk. Um, And there is um, uh, some money actually set aside for respite services. It's not a lot, it's not a lot per year, but you know, if there's a weekend that someone needs to get away or there's a surgery that somebody needs to go to, there's an opportunity to have Medicare pay for some of that respite service through the model. The model just started a few months ago. Our organization goes live on it um, in the spring. So it's, you know, it's going to be a bit of a slow rollout, but it's mm-hmm. coming. And it, it definitely represents a it represents a, an important step by Medicare, in my mind, sure. into Alzheimer's. That's a good shift. That's yeah. really good to know. That's very, very that's very um, great, good to know. Yeah, it's heartening. Know. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it's yes. encouraging because I've been saying that you know for so long. We've been saying, you know, it's it it. We can't control bad players. That you know we can't. So we have to we have to we have to create it. We have to create how it has to be, and then that and then they have to back into it. So yep. they have to back into the way it is, so that. We can avoid the kind of, you know, lonely lives that you're talking about, you know, very small lives that don't have to be that small yet. So I think you're an incredible uh, human and appreciate you you so much. I mean, I'm, I'm so much more impressed with you. I had no idea what to expect and like you're, you have so much to offer and so, and your compassion is just beautiful and Thank you're, you so much. you're oh no I, I it's very moving for me I just love what you're doing and your Lizzie care is is just awesome I mean it should be everywhere and um, how you support the arts is just you know phenomenal because it America sucks about when it comes to supporting the arts you know oh, almost nice. every other country has you know all kinds of funding earmarked for arts and we have zero you know we are on our own so you know it's god bless you for doing this for other artists to get their beautiful work out there and um you know we're all grateful to you thank you thanks i appreciate that i'm grateful for you what you guys are doing i mean you are you're bridging the gap for people and you're making alzheimer's you know understandable for people and you're sharing your story and that's so much of what dementia spring is trying to do whether it's you know sam simon and his play dementia man where he tells you how he's grappling he has a diagnosis of dementia by the way he is performing one of the only performers that we know of who has 
Alzheimer's disease and is on stage on a regular basis. We're looking for others. If you find others, let us know. But when Absolutely. I'm on the phone with Sam, when I'm on the phone with Sam, he always says, I might be the only one. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, well, but, it's you also know. like Greg O'Brien. You know, you're familiar with Greg O'Brien that wrote um, mm -hmm. um, on Mars, and and yep. we go, I had the the honor to interview him on our show, and he just blew me away because he's been living with Alzheimer's for a very long right. time. That's and right. His his cognitive reserve is his journalistic acumen, right? right? And so I I was like, how is he remembering all this? But he said to me, Susie, I write everything down immediately. I write it all down. And I just think it these kinds of people like you said, like like what is his name that do does the one man show? Oh, S S Sam Simon. Sam Simon, which I have to see that show. I've heard about it. Very um cool. and, and Greg O'Brien, these are these are gifts to all of us to get inside what it's like to to live in this journey, live underlined. Yes. You know, one of the things that I also love about the arts piece i reference another organization we work with, um, Flaco Jimenez and the, what's the Oye Group in Brooklyn. They have a project <laughs> called Mercedes, which we latched onto. We love the Mercedes project. And he's going to be performing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music with the Mercedes program, including some virtual reality about living with dementia, seeing things through Mercedes' life. One of the nice things about the arts, I find, is that it really also lets us reach other communities that are harder to reach when all you've got is sort of white coat, you know, institutional, um, you know, university programming, it reaches the people who like that. But for a lot of communities, whether it's an immigrant community or a Hispanic community, or whether it's a, you know, a, like, you think of a million you communities, yeah. anything, yeah. the gay and lesbian community, whatever it is, the arts are a great way to get in there um, and kind of meet them on their own playing field, right? Meet them where they are, right? And do yes. that through the arts. And so, you know, I, I just love the collaboration between a physician and a poet to try to bring, you know, story storytelling and resources. So we wrote we wrote the resource guide for the events that he's doing. We made sure it was both in English and in Spanish and, and really down to the local level for the communities that he's in. Beautiful. But those are just beautiful collaborations yeah. that I just, you know, I feel like getting bringing 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 the little bit that I have to share and know about the science and about the medical medicine and about the disease to combining that together with the creative um, spirits and juices of all the people who want to tell these stories mm -hmm. is just been a very powerful concoction. Um, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. you know, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to communicate with a far bigger audience um, and a far broader set of, of people who need help um, than I would have been otherwise. And I just want to say, just to add on to that, is that when I thought about doing My Mom and the Girl, and mm -hmm. people had said it, because I would tell the story at a party, because it has your mom, and I'd tell the story, because it's all true, right? They'd go, mm -hmm. oh, my God, you oh need to God. do a, a short film on that. And I'd say, yes. oh, I don't know. There's so many Alzheimer's. Who, it's just that the world needs is another Alzheimer's movie, right? And a short. Who's going to see it? da 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 and, you know, at the end of the day, I, I, I thought, you know, I, I ruminated on it. I thought, it is pretty extraordinary, these three disparate people from, you know, mm -hmm. LGBTQ and, and, you know, Latina and a Jewish mom from, you know, from New Jersey and getting and really affecting each other. And so, yes. Donald, yeah, Donald, tell you, like, when we released it and we were all over the world at, at all these film festivals and we were blown away by how many people it affected from teenagers yes. to yes. elders. And we just screened it again at Belmont Village here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which is an assisted living with, with residents and their family members. And the residents loved it and were so engaged with the conversation after. And they said, this needs to be shown every year to everybody because, they, because it made them feel okay. Yeah. Yeah, you and, know, I, and it's yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was just going to say it's it. It was when we did. We said, "Who's this?" Is so specific. How is anyone going right, to relate right. to this? And what we found is that specificity was the universal language that everyone can yes. share in. So that, tell your story. Like, even though yeah. it's not exactly the same, yeah, it. They everyone got it. We were shocked. We had no yeah, idea. So I meant to say the button is tell your story. Don't think that it's not valuable. 
Yes. Everybody's story is valuable. Everybody's. And the more stories we tell, the more we will dilute the bias. Yep. And right? And the ages yep. and the ableism and all those things that we yep. have really ingrained in our in our in our public, in our society, that we can counter it with storytelling. And get rid of the fear. It's so because the, the fear of it is something that that everyone, whether you have it or you or you don't, lives with, and make it so less fearful. I think that's and that's what you're doing. You know, when I go back to the, the what we talked about earlier, which is that um, I, I think we talked about it earlier. I've had a lot of meetings today and conversations today, but I thought we talked about it. So, you know, less than half or about half of the people who have early stage dementia have a diagnosis today. So that's, that's not good. Less than 10% of people who have mild cognitive impairment, which often precedes dementia, and for which you can now receive drugs if you have a diagnosis, less than 10% of those people have a diagnosis. But they are experiencing the disease. And the fact that they are sort of not doing it publicly means that they are alone and they don't get the chance to see themselves in the arts and in on screen and in dance and in music and in so and so when when Arlita Hall in Chicago who we gave a grant to creates a comedy about using improv to deal with dementia and laughter you see yourself when mm-hmm. people like Sam talk about what it's like to get a diagnosis and to go home and tell your wife about that and to decide whether to take a trip or not um, or whether to even do this play. You see yourself in it, even if you haven't acknowledged the disease to yourself or if no doctor has told you that you have the diagnosis. So I, I often feel like, you know, we talked about wheelchairs and nursing homes on one side of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum is a partially hidden secret um, and almost unrecognized world of people who have the, the symptoms but don't have the diagnosis, but mm-hmm. they are experiencing it and they feel it internally. So, mm-hmm. it, you know, I almost call this population underserved, mm-hmm. right? Because without the diagnoses, they can't get the treatments. Without the diagnoses, they can't get the care managers and the navigation help. Mm-hmm. And so how do we find them? How do we bring things to them to solve problems? And how do we show them that other people have lived this journey before? And how do we get them to be able to look out and recognize themselves in popular mm-hmm. culture, whether that's mm-hmm. a dance, a song, um, you know, a, a, just all, the, all have, these things yeah. and embrace it. You, know, you, yeah. you, you, you would do so much for them. But uh-huh. um, again, it's and the also, artists who have to do it. The doctors yeah, can't and do also, it. Yeah, and also I think that there's other films that have been out there that, that I also, you know, did a disservice by being uh, this is in, in the past, not recently. I'd say there's been some that uh, that actually perpetuated fear. To, yes. So it'd be you know so it only showed the negative side. Always, I have a big always. problem with that, and I don't. Always. We and talk I've about said that. A lot that in the yeah, and I've said that so many times, and and I'm very unpopular right. when it comes to one movie because, and I'll say it, I don't care. Still, Alice, I think did a disservice. I don't. I I know the people that did it, and I'm sorry. I I respect you, but you know when I watched it, I was like, that's not how it rolls out. It doesn't. Right. That's wrong. Right. And you and you miss a lot of the doom and gloom. There's a, we talk about this a lot in some of our panels that we did a festival this past spring in New York and we had panels. We talk about this topic. Right. Which is the doom and gloom narrative. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, people can't stand it. They find it pervasive um, and the, they call it the tragedy narrative. Mm-hmm. But there is laughter along the way. There is joy. There is love. There is sharing. There yeah. is uh, silly trips. There are right. wacky moments. There's dramatic moments. Um, sometimes, yeah, a lot of it's sort of a very silent, you know, doom and gloom narrative. One of the things that I try to do when we give grants to folks, a lot of them are in you know, pre-production on whatever their project is, whether it's dance or music or something. I try to work with them a little bit on avoiding cliche Yay. because... Otherwise, you just sort of end up with like, oh, I'm going to make a movie about Alzheimer's. Great. I'll have the person get lost, and then I'll have the person, like, have the keys taken away, and then I'll have them leave the stove on, and then right. I'll have them, you know, I'll have, you know, I'm just like, okay, but, like, what about the rest of life? There were, there were right, things right, between, right. 
you know, so trying to get and out of the cliche a little bit. I, we, and we, how we about look the exploitative, we, the exploitative side too? I found I found that too when I was working with the Alzheimer's um, Los Angeles mm -hmm. here because I was working with them very closely, and they would say, you know, would you take a look at this film because we want to think should we get behind it? And there was many. Mm -hmm films that, especially documentaries, that were very exploitive, exploitative of mm. their family member. And, to, and it's really, you know, sort of, you know, looking at the, the uh, accident on the road, you know, just like, here's yeah, the they, horrible they things that happen. Yeah. That, they and it's focus like and magnify that, that, the indignities, yeah. They, the they indignities, focus and magnify yeah. the indignities and, and yes. you know, to show, oh, when you have this, you have no more dignity. And it hurts my soul to watch happen. those things. So I would say no and no to certain things like that because I said, no, I don't want that perpetuated. By the way, people that have cancer, people that have, you know, MS, mm -hmm. all, we all suffer indignities, but those are private. We don't need to share those. That's, you know, that's not for, that, that doesn't make or break you as a human being at, and doesn't define you as a human being, right? Do you agree? Yeah, it's very, it's, we talk about this a lot too when I get artists together and we do panel discussions about this, is sort of what is the proper amount of exposure to mm -hmm. essentially decide that someone with memory loss who may not be able to decide for themselves whether they want that level of exposure, how much is appropriate to do or not do. I think, I think before social media, there was a lot of thoughtful conversation about this. Right. I think people really wrestled with whether it was OK to take photographs. I mean, you know, I've got I've got many photo photographers and we work with the Bob and Diane Fund. Oh, yeah, I know, you know them. People, yes. people take photographs of people with dementia, which I think is fine. And, and, and sometimes those photographs are very personal. And, and but sometimes they are showing how personal a journey it is. And I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But that person may not have given consent. Mm -hmm. They gave passive consent. They obviously love you, and they've probably watched you be a photographer your whole life, and you've probably been photographing them your whole life, but they didn't give permission for you to publish it and you know, put it out there, but they trusted you for everything, and you've made the decision to do it, to communicate something, to, to, right, to collaborate. Right, right. I, a lot of artists, when they talk to me about using... Um, the subject, the, the person with dementia as the subject, they talk about as a collaboration from the artistic side. Like I've had artists say to me, when my mom and I were, they would say, my mom and I collaborated on that project. And I remember the day the collaboration was born. Something happened. There was some magic. And they said, that was the collaboration. And I've chosen to share that with the world, even though it shows mom in some compromising situations that you and I might not really want to share. I think there was a lot of thoughtful discussion about this and what are the limits to that and how far you can push it or not push it. It's a and, great conversation. With yeah. social media, it's tough, right? I mean, you know, the world is so permissive about yes. imagery now that, you know, most of us with phones are generating at least five or six pictures a day on something, whether that's the sunset on the ride home or a selfie with your cousin or... You know, the, the, I, got, I got something leaking from the heating duct. I photographed it and sent it to my wife. Like, you know, it's just everyone's taking pictures of everything now. And I, I don't know what the right balance is, but I agree with you in situations where it seems oddly exploitative or oddly um, just embarrassing to an a extent that was unnecessary. Um, right. I, don't know that that, I don't know that that act robs them of dignity. When, when I talk about dignity, I'm usually talking about how do we preserve someone's dignity personally amongst us, right? How, do, how, how does the day-to-day -day for this person feel? Mm -hmm. How do their experiences feel minute to minute? I'm a little, I'm, when I talk about dignity, I'm not so much talking about whether or not their underwear got put on social media or not, you know. Right, but right. it's an issue. It's, it's a hard issue, and it's been made more complicated now by the ease with which people can create imagery and stick it wherever they want. Yeah. Right. I think that clickbait. When, clickbait. when there's no, yeah, when there's no takeaway from it, Meaning that here's the indignity, and all your it's just to show how bad it is. That's it. There's no there's no lesson. There's no knowledge. There's right. no you don't take anything away from it. If you can yep. then take that indignity and say okay, it, and learn something from it, or or, or enlightened, then I think right. that's where the conversation hopefully would go to. You know, as opposed to just this is bad. Look how terrible this is. 
Yeah, yes, I mean it becomes it. it. Yeah, it becomes it's it's like clickbait or it's like you know any yeah. any movie if it's if you're gonna do a sex scene in a movie is it does it serve the story or is it just porn? You know, are we just like you know <laughs> what I mean? Does it serve the story to to have this love making in which often it does, but oftentimes you're like, okay, we got it. They're making love. We we get it. We know how to do this. You know, and it's like, is a, not that I'm a prude. I'm not. It's just that you know I don't really care. You know, right. and also to see somebody you know in a compromised situation when they're when they have Alzheimer's, you know, maybe with their hygiene or whatever this case may be, you don't need to focus on it that long. People will get it. And so it becomes that's when I those are things that I think mm. all, do want, you know, really deserve a conversation and and we should keep that going because I I you know, look at I'm doing a documentary based on nursing home, you know, ab- abuse and neglect and I and I have to be very considerate about how we present it um yes. and there is a fine line so yeah anyway this has been great we're talking forever yeah. i told you we talked a lot guys thank you yeah <laughs> yeah wow so okay well really appreciate you and um love what you're doing we are Thanks. all about love we we are we're doing this because we care and love and that's the only reason that's, why we're doing this yes and that's, that's right. because love is powerful love is contagious and love conquers alls. We thank everybody for watching, listening today. Please, we'll, we'll put up all of, of Dr. Mark's information about everything that he's doing. And uh, please uh, like us and subscribe and do all those fun things. And uh, sure, we'll sure, be seeing sure. you next time. Yeah, yeah, everyone be good. Have fun and, and be grateful. <laughs> Absolutely. You guys. Take care, thank everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.